All right, well, welcome to Sunday. Welcome to Equipping Hour, Grace Bible Church. Uh, today, we are going to start a new series. It's just a short two-week series on the return of Christ and the coming kingdom from the Old Testament prophets. Uh, this is a new series, but really it's going to feel maybe like an extension from the last few weeks in Equipping Hour. More things that happen at the end. I've titled it The Return of Christ and the Coming Kingdom from the Old, uh, from the Old Testament Prophets. And we, we won't cover everything that the prophets have to say about the second coming, the return of Christ, the expectation that comes with that. But we won't be camping out really on one passage or another passage for too long either. So this will be something uh, in between a sermon and a survey. So let's go ahead and just uh, ask for the Lord's blessing on our time before we get started. Father in heaven, you are holy. You have put a plan in place, Lord, before the foundation of the world. You've seen fit to disclose who you are to your image bearers. Even though we live in a fallen world, we've sinned against you, and yet you have an enduring love for your people. Lord, thank you for disclosing all that you have. We live in a time where we can look back and see your faithfulness in delivering your word to your chosen people in every epoch of time for thousands of years, and you remain faithful still, Lord. I pray that as we look back at the expectations that you've given to your people, that we would look forward with the same anticipation that they did so that we might be encouraged to walk a straight life, to live in anticipation of your coming, Lord, and to glorify you in all that we do. Lord, thank you for eschatology. Thank you that you do give us a heads up on what's about to happen. Lord, I pray that we would live in the imminence of that, and I pray you'd bless our time today in your word. In Christ's name, amen. All right, well, good morning. Again, more things to come in equipping hour in God's providence when I took the opportunity to preach an eschatological text from the Old Testament, I didn't know that Smed was going to preach a three-week series and teach on the rapture of the church. And it works out nicely because we're going to be looking at things that happen after that. If you go ahead and open up your Bibles to Hosea 3, that's where we're going to call home base for this equipping hour this morning. I'll go ahead and read the, the text, the two verses that we're going to look at in a little bit more detail before we look at some more context surrounding the topic. Hosea 3, we're going to look at verses 4 and 5. And this is a, a purpose statement, so we'll back up and get to what happened before this, but it begins like this. For the sons of Israel will remain for many days without king or prince without sacrifice or sacred pillar, and without ephod or household idols. Afterwards, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days." The New Testament's expectation for a rapture that could happen at any moment will remove the pillar and support of the church, of the, of the truth, I'm sorry, the, the church being the pillar and support of the truth, it will be gone and things will go from bad to worse. And yet there will still be two groups remaining on the earth. Who are those two groups? Israel and the nations. And so if I can get our uh, timeline slide up, I think you will recognize, uh, not perhaps the exact slides we were looking at last week, but you'll recognize the uh, categories and timelines of biblical eschatology. What you're looking at here is what the Bible teaches about the end time. Uh, there, beginning with the cross and the church age, the present age, you have the imminent rapture of the church, which we talked about the last three weeks, the judgment seat of Christ, the 70th week of Daniel, the coming of Christ, the divine restoration of Israel, 
the millennial reign of Christ, the final judgment of unbelievers, and the final state of eternity. Our focus is going to be uh, there on number four and five, the second coming of Christ and the divine restoration of Israel. If you can highlight that, that would be great. What we heard about last week as Smed finished up was that the rapture would occur before the great tribulation period, the 70th week of Daniel. The Bible is consistent in that it describes a very terrible time that we have to look forward to before the Lord establishes his kingdom on the earth. And when the rapture happens, with it, the pillar and support of the truth are removed from the earth and it gets bad. And I know that Smed will at some point teach an equipping hour series that will put some color on that, along with preaching through the book of Revelation. The day of the Lord is, is consistent. And just by way of citation, I, I just want to point out where the day of the Lord is talked about throughout the Bible. It's called the day of the Lord in Obadiah 15, Joel 1, 2, 3, Amos 5, Isaiah 13, Ezekiel 30, Zephaniah 1, 1 Thess 5, 2 Thess 2, and 2 Peter 3, described as Jacob's trouble in Daniel 12 and Jeremiah 2, the great and terrible day of the Lord in Malachi 4 and 5, the day of the Lord's wrath in Zephaniah 1, the day of their wrath, that is the earth dwellers, the recipients of God's wrath in Revelation 6, the day of his wrath, that is the one who's pouring it out, the Lord, in Psalm 110, the great tribulation of, 20, of Matthew 24, and Paul calls it the day of wrath in Romans 2. And the, the Old Testament and the apostles spoke the same way about this period lasting seven years and really three and a half, according to Daniel and John. And again, Smed will work through the events that take place here in detail, but I wanted to highlight a short summary of what it's going to take to get to the period we're going to look at. The way that the Bible characterizes this period is like this, a day of destruction from the Almighty. Joel 1.15, a great and very awesome day, Joel 2.11, a day of clouds for the nations, Ezekiel 33, a day of darkness and not light, Amos 5.18, the day of the Lord is coming, it is near, it will come like a thief, and that's repeated over and over. Isaiah 13, Joel 2, 3, Ezekiel 30, Zephaniah 1, 1 Thess 5, 2 Peter 3. Here's what Isaiah says. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it. That's a small sampling of what the Bible has to say about this period. And notice that none of that came from the book of Revelation. When, God, or when, 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 when John writes the book of Revelation, his vision of the day of the Lord as he records it, from Revelation 6 and onward, he doesn't reinterpret, it reinterpret long-standing expectations. He confirms them. What he records meets every expectation of the Old Testament and of what the apostles put forward. And as you heard last week, the purpose of that period is a divine judgment on the nations and to bring Israel to repentance. It's a consistent message throughout the Bible that God will bring wrath on the earth and he's not keeping that a secret. When I drive down the 202, there's a billboard right now that is on, uh, on, on the way home, and it says, believe it or not, ready or not, Jesus is coming. This is not a secret. God has disclosed what his plans in the future, and everyone is aware of them. The day of the Lord is also purposed to bring Israel to repentance. This is what it will take. Everything I just described is what it will take to squeeze Israel into repentance and worship Christ, their king. So the purpose of this two-week series is 
to demonstrate the continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament when it comes to the expectation that Christ will possess an uncontested dominion and kingdom when he establishes a, a literal kingdom reign on the earth. We'll do that by looking at some of the outstanding promises of Hosea and Micah, and specifically the final outcome of that tribulation period. I just want to put up for you uh, a, just a comparison between a couple of verses we're going to look at. We're, today we'll look at Hosea 3, 4, and 5. Here's Hosea 5, and I want you to just look at also Micah 7, 17. We'll be in that passage next week. Hosea 3, 5 says, Afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. This is speaking, this is of Israel. Likewise, Micah prophesies about the nations, and he says, They will come trembling out of their fortresses and to the Lord our God. They will come in dread and they will be afraid before you. Both groups in this future generation will come trembling before the Lord. So the whole earth will tremble when the Lord God sends Christ back to the earth. These are literal expectations that are found in the New and Old Testament, and as those expectations are filled, filled in more and more with subsequent revelation, new revelation never cancels the straightforward meaning of what was previously disclosed. The people under the ministry and teaching of Old Testament prophets understood the expectation of wrath and the promise of a messianic kingdom as a future literal expectation. And that's been true in every epoch. Today, we'll zero in on Israel's future and kingdom expectation found in the book of Hosea. By Hosea's time, the promises that Israel's, that were the, the promises that were the object of Israel's hope were long-standing. Uh, Hosea wrote in the 8th century and there had been a lot revealed already to Hosea, a lot of scripture that we hold dear. You could categorize these, uh, what had been revealed, really into three categories, three covenants. Um, and the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the Davidic covenant. Two of those covenants were unconditional. One of them was conditional. And when I say covenant, I'm talking about where you can go into your Bible and you can see the word covenant. If you keep my covenant, this is the covenant I made. My covenant with my people. Those are the covenants I'm referring to. And I, I realize that these slides have got really tiny writing. Uh, I wanted to put uh, as, as much material there that you can follow up on. These will be uploaded to the website this week so you can follow up on some of these citations, if you like. But again, you have one conditional covenant, two unconditional covenants. And so, for example, when I go write a contract or I go sign a contract, there's two signature lines at the bottom, at the end of the contract. That's a conditional promise. That's a conditional contract. You build the building, I'll pay the bill. I'll build the building, you pay the bill we will both hold up one end of the deal or the other. An unconditional covenant, an unconditional promise, has one line. There, there's, there's, there's no contingencies. There are no prerequisites required on behalf of the other person. In fact, when you go cut a deal, that language itself has its origins in your Bible. I like to, uh, I, I, in my career, I've really enjoyed cutting deals. It's exhilarating and it's a lot of fun. But we don't really cut deals. We, we docu-sign them. And before that, we used ink. And before that, we used feathered ink. 
And before that, we used wax seals. I'm not sure what we used before that. But you've got to go all the way back to Genesis 15 to see what it means to cut a deal. Let's do that. Before we get to Hosea, let's touch on a few of these unconditional, unilateral commitments that God made to Abraham. Go to Genesis 15 with me. God's making promises to Abraham, and he makes a commitment by way of covenant, taking animals, cutting them in half, putting them on either side, and passing through them, essentially saying, if I don't fulfill my end of the deal, then let this happen to me. Meanwhile, Abram is passed out, leaning up against a tree. He's just not involved with the deal-making process. So this is a unilateral promise, a unconditional commitment. Begin with Verse 12, now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to him, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. How was that fulfilled? Literally. But I also will judge the nation whom they serve. Fulfilled literally. And after they will come out with many possessions. Possessions also fulfilled literally. Skip down to verse 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as as the great river, the river Euphrates. Now that is an outstanding promise, even to this day. And you might think, well, Solomon had it pretty good. And his territory did begin with the river Euphrates, but it only made it to the border of Egypt, not all the way to the Nile, which is right down the middle of the country. That, that, that would have been a precursor, a, 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 a blip on the radar for what is to come. Yet this promise made 4,000 years ago is still outstanding. In 14 times in the book of Genesis, from Abraham to Joseph, God reiterates the promise that he made to Abraham, and he adds detail that fills out that expectation as he reveals more about his own plans. And so again, you've got several notes that you can look at, and you can go back to these when I upload them this week. But just by way of uh, summary and review, what did he promise to Abraham? He said that, by, that the nations of the world would be blessed on Abraham's account. That God would multiply his descendants. And that one descendant in particular would possess the gate of his enemies. And that speaks to dominion. And this was uh, uh, illustrative when we went to Israel walking around the Solomonic gates that, and I would just, I had recalled that, you know, to possess the gate of your enemy doesn't just mean you have a war trophy. But to possess the gate of your enemy, well, what was the gate of your enemy? Well, not only was there an iron bar, but th that's where all the commerce took place. That's where the titles were written. That's where the government was administrated. This is where you would, there would be capital punishment would take place at the gate. Go back to the book of Ruth. So, so to beget, possess the gate of your enemies is to possess the enemies, is to possess dominion. To, to own the gate of a city is to own the city. And to not have any enemies at all is to have complete dominion. That was a promise made to Abraham. When Jacob prophesied about the future of his sons, he said that that particular ruling descendant would receive the obedience of the nations. In Genesis 49.10. The land promises, which you can just see a lot of citations here, are particularly difficult to, ta to not take literally. And, and it's important to remember that when you read the land promises of the Old Testament, they're nearly always associated with a messianic promise. So you've got to be careful about what to take literally and then fudge on the second half of that promise. 
You just remain consistent. It's all right to do that. There are very literal land promises. In fact, here are some of the things that are said about that land specifically. To your descendants, Abraham, I will give this land, Genesis 12, all the land which you see, Abraham, standing in that land, I will give it to you and your descendants forever. I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Why? To give you this land and possess it. To your descendants, I, will get, I have given this land. That's a future perfect tense as if it's already done. I will give you and to your descendants after you the land of Canaan. I will give you the land of Canaan and to your descendants after you. There'd have to be some kind of resurrection happening for that to take place. It will be an everlasting possession. To your descendants I will give this land, Genesis 24, to, on the land in which you lie, this is when he was in Bethel, I will give it to you and your descendants. Again, in order to give something to him and his descendants, there would probably need to be some resurrection happening. So the covenant that God makes with Abraham uh, not, not only is outstanding, but it is unilateral. And by the time the covenant that God makes with David takes place, Dave, his, his promises to David simply confirm what he promised to Abraham. So those promises in David's day were intact and still yet future. Listen to what it says in 2 Samuel 7, 12. I will raise up your descendant, that's that particular messianic one, after you, who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. Listen to what Psalm 89 says. This is a messianic passage written by David about the Messiah. Psalm 89, 29 says, I will establish his descendant forever and his throne as the days of heaven. My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. That's significant. That is Psalm 89, 34. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. This is what the Lord says. So he will not alter the meaning of what he said when he said it. That is a very significant passage when it comes to understanding future promises, especially now in the church age, where there's a variety of views that people take when they go back and look at the Old Testament and decide maybe it meant something that the people in the Old Testament didn't even understand. Don't do that. God says he will not alter the utterance of his lips. You have to be careful with that. So this is just a small sampling of what Israel had by Hosea's day. He had much more. And Hosea, let's go ahead and look at Hosea in its context. You can flip back there if you left it. Hosea, the theme of the book is that God keeps his promises. If you are a note taker and you put notes and dates and themes at the headings of your book, you can just write that down right next to Hosea. God keeps his promises. And the thrust, the exhortation of the book of Hosea is to return. Return to the God who keeps his promises. Hosea's generation was an apostate generation. And in August, Lord willing, I look forward to working through the entire book in our 66 books series. Uh, and we can look at all that Hosea has for us. It's a very rich book. And I really look forward to doing that together. But you're familiar with how the book of Hosea starts. You're familiar with the Hosea-Gomer marriage as an illustrative framework for God and Israel. This is a historical marriage that took place. That's important because that can be contested by commentators at times. And it's a marriage that God arranged. So an historical arranged marriage where Hosea is the husband, Gomer is the wife. And Hosea had the um, maybe unenviable task, but a privilege nonetheless, of not only being a herald of God's message, but God says, uh, I'm going to go ahead and not just give you a message, but I'm going to have your life illustrate the content of that message. Paint these people a picture God says to Hosea, with your life. 
So he tells him to go marry a prostitute, and that's what he does. He could have started in chapter 4. If God was not a relational God, he was a distant God, a judge at a bar that we anticipated in fear but didn't have any relationship, perhaps starting in chapter 4 would have been the right thing to do. Look at chapter 4. The, here's, here's how it starts. Listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel. For the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land. Because there is no faithfulness, truth, there's no truth, or kindness, or knowledge of God in the land. I mean, he doesn't start there. God wants his people to understand that he's more than their judge. There's a relationship at stake here. God is a sovereign and all-powerful God, but he's also a compassionate father who genuinely loves his people. And, and, he, and he wants to convey that. He's patient to convey it because by the time Israel makes it to Hosea's generation, they were long gone. The, the generation was apostate. And yet God is patient. You know how the story goes? Gomer is a prostitute to begin with. That's also a detail that sometimes gets contested. We'll cover that and bring that out from the grammar of the text uh, when we're together in August. So he marries a prostitute, and she repeatedly is unfaithful to her husband. And Hosea, by chapter 3, has sidelined Gomer at God's instruction. Now, he, he could have put her to death. And it, it would have been lawful to do that. Leviticus 20 says that the uh, consequence for adultery in Hosea's day under God's law was for the adulteress to be put to death along with partner. So that would have been justified according to the law and it would have drawn some attention from Hosea's contemporaries that he didn't do that. Hosea's arranged marriage represented a relationship between God and Israel, and if God's plans were to cut Israel off completely and cancel his promises to Abraham, to cancel his promises to David on the account of the apostate generation that Hosea lived in, then putting Gomer to death would have made a lot of sense. But he doesn't do that. That's not what happens. Okay, let's work through the, the text of, of Hosea 3, 1 through 5. So, Hosea has, has, brought, has, has repurchased Gomer from the marketplace, from adultery. And it's a short chapter. I'll go ahead and just start with verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, that's Hosea, go again and love a woman who is loved by her husband. That's Hosea also. Yet an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other, God and, uh, other gods and love raisin cakes. So I, Hosea, bought her for myself, for 50 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. That's, that would be market price. Then I said to her, you shall stay with me for many days. That's significant. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a husband, so I will also be toward you. Sidelined. Why? This is representing something. Verse 4. For the sons of Israel will remain for many days. The idea there, remaining, is just the word to sit down. That's where you get the idea of sideline. They will sit down. They're going to take a seat for many days. Without king, without prince, without sacrifice, without sacred pillar, and without ephod or household idols. It's a whole, whole list of things that were important to the people of Hosea's day. This is the removal of every resource. And in doing so, God is putting forward his prescript concerning Israel's path to restoration. First, a duration of hardening. A duration of hardening. God would remove their national identity. Their national identity. No more kings. No more princes. And along with the national identity comes national protection, 
national provision. He would remove sacrifice. Now, sacrifice was prescribed. This was a part of uh, uh, the order of worship in the day. And yet God says, you're not doing it in faithfulness. You're apostate, and I'm removing that from you as well. No more pillars. There are pillars all over Israel. When I, when I say pillar, I think Egyptian obelisk. Okay? And on these obelisks, these pillars would be the names of foreign gods. This is where they would go to worship, offer grain offerings, offerings sacrifices even to false gods. The pillars themselves were just stones, but they were representing the worship, the false worship and false idols that were scattered throughout the land. Uh, it's interesting to note that the pillar itself is just a piece of stone, but in uh, Isaiah 11, when he, which is also a wonderful messianic passage, kingdom passage, when, when the Messiah, when Christ does come back and establish his kingdom, he'll have a pillar in Egypt to Yahweh. So then the Egyptians will know the Lord, and the Egyptians and the Assyrians, historical enemies of Israel, will come and worship Yahweh their king. In any case, the ephod is gone. That's that uh, linen that is associated with worship and prayer by kings, prophets, etc. And household idols, these are inherently evil. These are the things that uh, every household was full of. And so when you just see what the entire book of Hosea says about what apostasy looks like, you can just imagine worshiping everything, everywhere, syncretism, presumption on God, But there would be a day of repentance to come. It, it, it would come. The fidelity of Israel's repentance would look like this. They would repent at the appointed time. So God has says, afterward, after these many days have occurred, the sons of Israel will return. And when you read the word return, in the book of Hosea especially, and throughout your Old Testament, you can think of the word repentance. In the New Testament, the repentance comes from the idea of, of changing with the mind. Okay? In the Old Testament, the, the word return is that sign that you are looking for when you drove too far. You turn. That's the idea of repentance, and that's how Hosea describes it. So when you see return here, this is referring to repentance. So they will return, they'll repent, and seek the Lord their God, and David their king. We've already seen how David is set up. Uh, this is 240 years after David has died, and so this is clearly messianic reference. And they would come to Yahweh with an appropriate fear and embrace his character finally at that time in the last days. But that would be far off. Hosea's ministry took place during an apostate generation and for the northern kingdom of Israel, the wheels were coming off and Judah was not far behind, only about 120 years before the Babylonian exile. In 722 BC, the Assyrian army brutally removed the northern kingdom from its territory and displaced the Israelites, took them as captives. This was a judgment of God. The nation that had broken covenant, that conditional covenant, with the Lord, had done it for long enough, and they would have to suffer the consequence. And so just look at a couple of uh, thematic texts to that point in Hosea. Look at Hosea 1.4. This is what God plans to do. And the Lord said to him, to Hosea that is, name him Jezreel, this is his first child, for yet a little while and I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. Look at 1.6, and this is how he refers to his people now that they had been apostate long enough. His second child, name her illustrably Lo Ruhama, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel. Verse 9, and the Lord said, name him, third child, Lo Ami, for, I am, or for you are not my people, and I am not your God. That is a devastating message. Turn the page. Look at chapter 9, verse 3. This is the consequence that an apostate people had to suffer. And it says, uh, 
they will not remain in the Lord's land. But Ephraim will return to Egypt, and in Assyria they will eat unclean food. So they're evicted, and this is, what, this is the expectation that Moses put forward. We'll get to that in just a moment. Hosea 10, 15. At the, end of the, uh, at the end of chapter 10, it says, At dawn, the king of Israel will be completely cut off. So there it is. You've, you've lost all national resource. You've lost your spiritual provision for acceptable worship as God has prescribed it. And the cherry on top is that God will do away with their idolatry. And that would uh, come to pass for Judah after their 70-year exile. They left polytheists in the same condition that uh, the northern tribes were in, and yet they came back monotheists, worshiping the Lord. And so, the, so God would have his purposes, and they'd play out whether or not his people kept their end of the bargain. They'd be expelled from the land because they rejected God's statutes and presumed on him rather than pursuing him. Moses wrote about this, If you want to turn with me, you can just see how this was an expectation that Hosea was consistent with and that the people in Hosea's day should have anticipated. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 29, beginning in verse 22. This is uh, from Mount Nebo where Moses is about to send the nation into the land of promise after God had built the nation in Egypt and They had wandered the desert for 40 years in Moab. Moses says, Now the generation to come, verse 22, your sons who rise up after you and the foreigner who comes to you from a distant land, when they see the plagues of the land and the diseases with which the Lord has afflicted it, they will say, All of its land is brimstone and salt, a burning waste, unsown and unproductive. The word unsown is significant there. And no grass grows in it. Like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adam and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath. All the nations will say, why has the Lord done thus to this land? Why this great outburst of anger? Then men will say, because they, the Israelites, this future generation, forsook the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Even the nations bear witness to this. They went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they had not known and whom he had not allotted them. Therefore, the anger of the Lord burned against that land to bring upon it every curse which is written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land and in anger and fury with great wrath cast them into another land as it is this day. Skip down to 30 verse 1. So it shall be, Moses says, when... All of these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse with which I have set before you, and you call them to mind. This is instruction for this later generation when the things in Hosea's day take place. They need to recall these things. In the nations, uh, in, in the nations where the Lord God has banished you, and you return, there's that word again, to the Lord your God to obey him with all of your heart, and so according to all that I command you today, you and your sons. Then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity. Now, now, now hit pause. Moses is speaking to millions of of Israelites who God had formed uh, this nation in Egypt. Now they're in the desert. They haven't even entered the land yet. Moses is talking about being in captivity and then being rescued from captivity. I don't know what I think about that. If you're standing there on Mount Nebo and, and Moses is preaching this sermon to you and he's saying, look, you are going to experience blessing. And then your sons, the generations that follow you, are going to be an apostate generation. And then the Lord is going to undo what he's doing today. You're about to enter the land. He's going to remove them from it. However, He says, verse 3, When the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord God has scattered you. 
If your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. The Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he will prosper you and multiply you greater than your fathers. This hasn't happened yet. Disbursement, yes, but restoration from the ends of the earth, that's a promise that remains outstanding. God knew before Israel stepped foot in the land that Israel would enter the land and what would happen. He knew what was going to happen. If you skip over to Hosea, if you get back into Hosea, look at chapter 13. Not Mark. Okay. Chapter 13, this is what happened. He knew this would take place. Chapter 13, verse 6, or 5, rather. I cared for you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. And as they, Israel, had their pasture, they entered the land, that is, they became satisfied. And being satisfied, their heart became proud. Therefore, they forgot me. That's what happened. And there's implications there for sure. We'll spend time on that in, uh, uh, when we get to Hosea in August. But for Hosea and their generation, Hosea says, this is what's going to happen. You guys are being evicted from the land. And sure enough, Assyria put an end to the northern kingdom and dispersed the nation not long after Hosea wrote. Judah was exiled to Babylon 120 years later, but Judah's return after the 70 years couldn't have been that fulfillment that we just saw, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant. Those expectations were still outstanding. They were still a vassal state of Persia when they returned. And and so the, 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 the kingdom expectation that we have throughout our Bibles is not only outstanding, they're tremendous. There's so much written on them. We're, all, we're only just touching a couple mountaintop peaks from one book, and yet they're scattered throughout all of the prophets of the Old Testament. And then there's continuity in the New Testament. This expectation for a literal kingdom on the earth in fact, we, talked, we started out by talking about the, the wrath that it would take in order to bring Israel to the repentance that Hosea talks about, that Moses talks about. And so it's no surprise that when John the Baptist comes on the scene, the two things that you hear when he begins baptizing in Matthew 3 are repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then when the Pharisees see the, the masses of people coming to get baptized by John the Baptist in the wilderness, they're like, we've got to get in on this. And what does John say to him? You brood of vipers who warned you about the wrath to come. Both of these things, the kingdom expectations, wrath to come, literal expectations, still not here yet in John the Baptist's day. Let's just look at a couple more uh, New Testament passages to just... Um, solidify the fact that the expectations that the Old Testament puts forward for a literal kingdom on the earth are still outstanding, even in our day. So let's go to uh, first Acts 1. I just want you to see this. Acts 1, Jesus had already done his redemptive work at the cross. He had been with his disciples. He was resurrected. He, he had done all that he came to do in his first coming and his suffering. And he put on a 40-day seminar on what the kingdom was all about. So after presenting himself, verse 3, alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, he appeared to them, his disciples and the people, over a period of 40 days 
and speaking of the thing and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. And so he gives some instruction. And verse 6, when they, his disciples in particular, come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? Now that's specific language concerning an Old Testament expectation. Not just, are you going to establish a new kingdom now? But the kingdom of Israel. And even in the, uh, the Greek text, the word for establishing the kingdom is uh, a reestablishment. This is a, uh, it carries a nuance of something that has already got a precedent. Are you going to establish that now? There's no question concerning the nature of the kingdom in this question. No one's questioning the restoration of the kingdom or to whom the kingdom belongs, the recipients of the kingdom. The only question in this is the timing of the kingdom. Of course, Jesus says, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. And that's good, because if we did know the timing, then we would wait for the two-minute clock, wouldn't we? It's, it's good that we don't know God's timing and that only he knows it. That's a blessing to a mixed condition. And so these national promises are still outstanding for Israel. Even after Rome fell, you had the Byzantine Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the British Empire. All of them had a flag in the land at, at one point. And, and Jesus sets that expectation as well. Look at Luke 21, on, and I, I believe I'll have the text on the screen here. This is towards the end of his ministry, Passion Week, and he says, uh, here's the expectation, guys. They, Christians, will fall, fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And even that word until is it's, it's quite interesting. There's a there's a standard word in the Greek to, to use when you want to convey an, until, a start, and then a stop. And then there's another word that has got a reciprocal nuance to it, a start and stop, and then start again nuance to it. Luke uses that word here and in the previous passage. And so the details matter. The nations are going to trample underfoot during the times of the Gentiles the land that was promised to Israel. What about, well, what about now? What about like 1948? Well, I don't know. I think it's a catalyst for what's to come. I mean, there are certainly, you certainly don't see other nations coming back from the dead with the same religious charter they had 4,000 years ago. Uh, move forward to Acts 3. just want to demonstrate this point one more time. Acts 3.18, do I have it up there? Here's this passage one more time, okay. So Acts 3.18. This is uh, Peter's second sermon, and he's saying, but the things which God had announced beforehand by the mouth of his prophets, there's some continuity there in that detail, that his Christ would suffer has been fulfilled. You could say fulfilled literally. And then he exhorts him saying, therefore repent and return, those are those two words we saw before, so that your sins may be wiped away in order that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed, appointed to you. How does he describe Jesus? Whom heaven must receive until, and here, here's that, that word again, until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. So there is Peter in his second sermon saying, hey, how should we understand it? Understand it in just the plain way that the prophets spoke it. We look forward to that. Well, what do we do with this? Let's just go to Romans 11 to look at some implications for a future expectation of a literal kingdom for Israel on the earth after a great tribulation period. 
Romans 11 has implications for us. And, and Paul, starts his, Paul starts this section in chapter 9. Um, I've got a summary of chapter 9 through 11 uh, for you to look at. You can take this home once I upload it, if it's up there. But just an overall, uh, in, by way of overview, Paul addresses the issue head on, beginning in chapter 9, by, by asking the question, has God's promises failed? And the answer, of course, is no, 9-6. And then I'll, I'll, what I plan to do here is just to skip through chapter 9 and 10 and, and land at 11-11. You can meet me there or just follow along either way. So God's promises to Israel have not failed. After all, God never appointed to save every Jew, but that doesn't mean that God is unjust. For God never has, has the, uh, for God has the sovereign right to do as he pleases, chapter 9, 14 through 29. And so the question, why have the Gentiles attained righteousness while Israel is not? Well, the answer to that is faith in both cases. So in light of the rejection, apparent objection of, of Israel, has, has God permanently rejected them? He asks in uh, chapter 11, 1 and 2, by saying, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? Well, may it never be. See, Israel's hardening is partial, and that is what he goes over in verses 1 through 10. And then let's just go ahead and read verses 11 through uh, 29. He says this, I say then, did they, Israel, not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But their transgression, but by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and, and their failure is riches to the, for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection of the reconciliation is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but from life from the dead? If the first piece of dough is holy, then the lump is also, and if the root is holy, the branches are too. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them, and became a partaker with them of the root of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You then will say. The branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite, quite right, he says. They were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by, by your faith. So don't be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you. Behold, the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity, but to you, the kind, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to, to nature into a cultivated tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not want you to be unaware, my brethren, to be... A, to, to, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. That a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the gospel, they, Israel, are enemies for your sake, Gentiles, but from, God, from the standpoint of God, God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of their fathers, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. 
And so you just see that theme over and over and over that God's promises are consistent throughout the scripture, it's consistent from Genesis into the prophets, from the historical books and David, all the way down to the gospels and to Acts and even into the epistles. There's consistently consistency. And so the implications for us, for the church age, it comes right out of Romans 11, and that's don't be arrogant. Be, be fearful. Have hearts full of gratitude for what God has grafted you into. Don't be wise in your estimation. Certainly, take God at his word. There are other views on Israel. And, and if we take our convictions... And, and we sit down at the dinner table and we turn what we, the, the truth of the word into a cleaver, then we've done what Paul prohibits in 1 Corinthians 13. I could have all truth. I could have all prophecy. But if I have all those and I don't have love, I, I'm nothing. It doesn't matter. I'm ineffective, unhelpful. So don't, don't land in that category. Let your lack of, uh, lack of arrogance and, um, and, and not being wise in your own eyes extend to your entire character, not simply on the topic of eschatology. Next week, we will look at Micah 7, 14 through 20, and we'll look at what the Old Testament prophets have to say about the nations when... Christ returns to the earth to establish a kingdom. We'll do that from the Old Testament, and we'll see that continuity in the New Testament as well. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that, um, that you, you give us a consistent word, not filled with surprises and reversals of meaning, but a preservation of your commitments to your people, Lord. That's a privilege to be grafted into. Lord, we, we, we don't deserve what you've given to us. We're wild olive branches, um, content um, to be on our own, wise in our own eyes. And yet you've been so kind to graft us into your promises, Lord. Promises that weren't made to us as a nation, but yet we get to experience not just future promises, but present realities of your grace, Lord. I pray we would hold the eschatology that we're convicted of with love and that we'd be blessed by your word and encouraged. In Christ's name, amen.